next up, I would like to just get into it then. Um, Nikki, if she can come up here and help me out a little bit, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Nikki. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Nikki Fostova, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce James this morning. Um, I actually don't think James needs much of an introduction because you've either worked with him or been taught by him. Uh, but just in case you haven't seen this lovely man before, this is James Thomas. Uh, James has been in Brno working as a teacher and teacher trainer for about, James, how long? 25 years? 20, 20 years. Um, James used to work with me at the university and he's now freelancing and going all over the world talking about teacher education and he's very big on corpora and James is gonna show you lots of his websites this morning. Um, James, is there anything else that you would like me to say? Lovely. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mr. James Thomas. I've been using this We Live in an Era of for, for, some, for some time, and each time I, I use it, I, I develop it, of course. Um, and part of my idea, uh, part of my idea here is that there are many aspects of our various fields He's going to fix that. Um, that we live in an era of many, many new things are happening in, in uh, various aspects of our fields. And they include the things I've got there in the middle with to do with our students being very literate in ICT, that everybody's got easy access to the internet, that blogs, wikis, MOOCs, online learning platform, those things that you can see there. And I'm going to. Okay. All right, so the, the idea is, as you can see, the things we've got in the middle are, are things to do with ICT, which our students are quite um, familiar with and that we've got easy access to. Um, the things on the left, these some of the very important things that we have in teaching, teacher education, uh, language acquisition studies. And one of the things I'm particularly interested in is, is the things that we've got on the right. And all of these things on the right are relatively not new in language, obviously. They've been in language for a long time, but they've recently had a lot of attention from linguists. Things like collocation, use of corpora, multi-word units, word templates, pragmatic competence, etc. And what I'm particularly interested in is the idea that linguists and pedagogues don't talk to each other very much. They don't attend each other's conferences, they don't read each other's journals, and sometimes for very good reason. Um, so my idea is that let's marry. So let's marry the, I, the, the things in the fields and let's get language teachers and pedagogues, sorry, pedagogues and linguists talking to each other. So um, this is one of my favorite mottos here, new linguistic features beget new learning tasks. So you may remember that when we uh, started talking about, um, people came up with things like uh, non-defining clauses. I find that one of the least interesting things I've ever had to teach, but as soon as people came up with things like that, they ac activities then evolved, evolved around them. So any sort of new linguistic feature which comes up is an opportunity to create a new type of learning task. And this is um, actually the title of an article I, I wrote and was published in the, the book from the symposium last year. And I, I, I use this because I think it's quite an interesting and a very important way of moving forward in our teacher training. Um, I've been writing books for quite some time and I've 
been a bit distressed to find recently that I seem to have been writing the same book for a very long time and <laughs> having, having titles like Discovering English and Discovering Academic Prose and Prepositions and Teacher Training and Focus on Frames and you name it. And it seems to be more or less the same book and um, I am going to finish uh, this one. It's at the moment it's called Collocation Plus, The Grammar of Vocabulary. Uh, that should be ready in the next few, it was supposed to be ready in the next few weeks for me to send out to readers um, to get their views on it. In fact, if anybody here would like a, uh, a copy to read and critique before it goes to the next stage, I'd be very, very happy. But, um, I, and my, my work in this actually really took off when I did my MA with this absolutely fascinating title, Studying and Teaching the Verbs of Academic Prose. Um, which uh, uses this, use this book extensively, the grammar patterns from CoBuild. And what I found in doing that work was a lot of the ideas which I'm going to explain later in today's talk, but it really got me involved in lexico grammar, which was, for me, a big step. In fact, I even thought I'd invented the term and then I found Michael Lewis had been using it and Halliday had been using it, but I, I kind of arrived at it myself. So, um, but it wasn't the first book I published. Uh, the first book I published actually was a music book because my first, first half of my life was in music. And um, music had a very, very great influence on me. Um, I, I played the piano, I played viola. I used to conduct choirs and orchestras and musical director for shows and things in Sydney. Um, and you learn a lot from music. Um, Susan was talking about the impact of drama on, on her work, because she originally trained as a drama teacher. Where is she? Hello, yes. <laughs> um, and music has had a very important um, effect on me as well. Um, one of the things you learn from music is uh, the idea of structure. I remember asking my father, who was a musician, if these really long pieces of music had any structure. He said, yeah. I, I was only 12, but still, yeah. Um, and one of the things, um, uh, okay, this is a problem. I haven't got my notes, I'm sorry. Um, I, I will jump back to this. Uh, this, is how I, this is how I work. They're photos of my notebooks and how, we, how I arrive at sorts of work in progress, sort of on, on the way to conclusions. I, I, my desk and my notebooks look like this. The, the ones with all the cards, in fact, are when I first started preparing this talk, so I hope it's got the structure that I intended it to have. Um, and just other things, and you start to realize things, and when I do this, things actually, they gel. They wouldn't just gel in my mind. I, I really needed those sorts of things to move around and, and find patterns and structures and relationships between things. Sorry, these are the books that I've been, the books on the, over this side, uh, the books I'm finishing at the moment, the books in the middle, uh, books that I'm writing with somebody else, and the books on the over there are books that uh, other people are writing that I, I will publish. So I'm quite busy in this publishing arena, and as I've just indicated, I've got a lot of things which are not quite finished, but they're coming. Now, this is uh, one of my favorite photos. You can see what a great music teacher I was, because this is actually one of my, uh, uh, my class in my first year of secondary school teaching in the suburbs of Sydney at a, at a boys' school. And so I, to go back to what I was saying about music, the, um, it's been very important to me. So I le learned a lot about structure, learned a lot about terminology and the importance of terminology and the concepts that terminology embeds. Also the idea of, um, oh yes, it was also my introduction to foreign languages. When, you, when I, I, I went to a country high school, we had no foreign languages at all but having to learn terminology for music in Italian mainly was my introduction to languages. So music's had a very important formative role in my life. Um, yeah, and here are some of, the, some of the terms that we musicians know. Does anybody know any of these? Tremolo, interrupted cadence, glissando, ostinato, sonata form, morendo, fugue, paradiddle. Paradiddle's a great word. Um, and does anybody recognize da, 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 Ravel. Ravel's a composer. The piece is? Bolero, yes. 
And we could say, I love the way that snare drum plays that rhythm over and over and over for 15 minutes through this piece, when in fact we don't need to because we have a term. It's an ostinato. So we don't need a whole long phrase to describe something. We have a term. And this is our, one, of my, one of my points that I want to make today, is the importance of terminology in, in anything. So Ravel's Valera. And science is the study of names. Science names everything, processes and things, living and unborn. Everything starts with a name. Philosophers argue about the importance of a name. A name demonstrates the existence of a shared concept. So when we have a, n when we have a name or a term for something, we can actually talk about it. If it's just an idea floating around in our head, it's much more difficult. And terminology is extremely important. One of the uh, musical forms we talk about is theme and variations. We have a, a single theme and it's repeated many times with a break between each repetition and it's varied in some way. You might have different instruments play, you might have it in a different key, um, you might have it using da 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 instead of da 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 and many, many things change. So theme and variation is very important. And I was quite, pl quite delighted, I think I read about Milan Kundra's view of this in this book, Unbearable Lightness of Being. Do you know that Milan Kundra is from Brno? Just up the hill here. Porkinova 6 he was born at. Um, and his father was also a musician. But he talks about theme and variations as an extraordinary way that you can look at one thing in different ways, like a kaleidoscope or a... Um, or a I've forgotten the word. Painting by Picasso. Seeing the same thing from many different angles. <coughs> Another, the, perhaps the most important musical form is sonata form. It's the basis of symphonies, concertos, string quartets, everything. And it consists of three sections, an exposition, a development, and a recapitulation. And in the exposition, you get two melodies, you, uh, and, they, and they contrast. And the <coughs> whatever ensemble is playing it plays them one after the other. And then the next section, which is usually quite long, develops them and they're pitted against each other. And then we have a recapitulation when the two themes are replayed, but without the contrast. They're, they're much more reconciled. And it absolutely um, makes um, what classical music is. The earliest sonata forms are, by early sonata form pieces are for Haydn in the late 1700s. And and to this day, people are still writing pieces in sonata form. And only a few months ago, I, was, I don't know how, even how this occurred to me, but I thought, this is actually how I structure my teacher training. I, I very often do one week intensive courses, um, uh, 30 hours training by myself, and I, and I front load the first day. And many of the things that we do on the first day in the exposition are then unpacked during the rest of the course and at the end of the last day, Friday afternoon usually, we bring it all together and we find out, you know, we find the relationships and everything that between everything we've done. And I thought, how amazing is that? Maybe it's just, maybe that's how, how the world works anyway. Um, here's an example of some of my students' work in China last year. This, is, this was created on the Friday afternoon. This is a, an affinity map of their work of their work, their, their view of the course, the relationships they found between items. Here's another one. Uh, you can see work in progress here. This was a group of Chinese teachers of English at a university in Wuhan, and that's what they produced over there on the right. So that was their representation of the course. Um, yes. Okay, so here's a problem because I have a long quote to read you here, which is in my notes. Uh, science, a purely rational activity. Uh, this book by Marcel Gleiser, Dancing Universe, very interesting kind of philosophy of science book. Can I give you a moment to read that? I'm going to open my laptop and see if I can see my notes there.
science is often regarded as a purely rational activity in which objectivity reigns supreme as the sole avenue of knowledge. As a result, scientists are sometimes viewed as insensitive and narrow-minded, prone to strip away all the beauty of nature by approaching it mathematically. This labeling of scientists miss misses the most important motivation for doing science, which is precisely our fascination with nature and its mysteries. Behind the science's complicated formulas, the tables of data obtained from experiments and the technical jargon, you will find a person eagerly trying to transcend the immediate boundaries of life, driven by an unstoppable, unstoppable desire to reach some deeper truth. And that's what we do. That's what we're doing all the time. I think it's a really, really important thing. So, my... My big thing is um, learning language from language. And I've um, been working on this I idea for a long time. Um, not, not the only one, of course. It's, it's what, what we do in some ways quite a lot. But I'm particularly disturbed when I find a statement like this, which admittedly is 1933, but I think a lot of people still believe it. There is no systematic view of vocabulary because people don't know that vocabulary is systematic. And Thank you. All right. Um, so the reason, the reason we advance in, in science or in our knowledge of anything is because we have new tools and better tools. And you may be familiar with um, Roger, Pe Roger Sperry won in 1976 the Nobel Prize for his work on left brain, right brain. Well, 20 years later, with the invention of MRI scanning technology, we know that that left brain, right brain is complete, not absolute nonsense, but it just is the tip of the iceberg. So there's no way he would get a, a Nobel Prize for it today because it's, it's been superseded by advances in, in science which have come about through the advances in the technology. And here we've got a telescope which looks at things without, a microscope which looks at things within, and we've got some examples, uh, an example here of corpus software or corpus output which tells us a huge amount about patterns in language. And if you have a look at just another, you find out that um, it's very often expresses a negative thing which the words just and another don't. So there's sorts of patterns that we can observe when we've got the data sorted and presented in ways like this. Now, on the other side of the Atlantic from Mr. Bloomfield, who's an American, um, we have these three gentlemen, probably you've heard of them, you can see from what period they were between, between the wars. And they were three British pedagogical linguists who actually were quite interested in the patterns that um, they found in vocabulary. And they were already doing a lot of work on that. And it's a bit of a mystery to me what happened to their work because they, um, their work at the time was uh, focused on vocabulary teaching and they worked a lot with patterns and collocation, things which we thought came much later, but in fact, they were actively being taught and worked with in those be between the wars. Um, they weren't actually working in England. They are English, but they were working in, two of them were in Japan and one in India. And um, speaking of Japan, the other day I was coming back from Vienna and I was in a coupe with, coupe, that's, is that an English word? Uh, compartment on the train um, with two Japanese guys who were students, one of nuclear physics and the other of engineering, about 19, 20 years old. They could not speak English. A few words they could say to the girl that they wanted coffee, but they couldn't actually put it in a sentence. And I find that pretty distressing. If somebody mentioned the 20 years, uh, the six years of compulsory English that Japanese kids have had. And um, it's not peculiar to Japan. We, um, Nikki and I were, well, she still is, running a, a course at the faculty here for, uh, it's called the internal teaching practice, where the students come 
from anywhere in the university except an English department, and they are our teacher trainees students for a whole semester. So our trainees have a semester's course um, teaching these students. So they come freshly from gymnasium, secondary school, selective grammar schools, and their English is by and large terrible. And it was a great surprise. We had this assumption that Czech kids today would have really good English, but they absolutely do not. So I don't know why they don't, but they don't. So here's just a little photo of our trainees at work with, our, with their students. This has been going on for at least 10 years, but I know that Deborah Zemanova, who is in the audience, um, she preceded me in the job, and I know that she was doing similar work with, with, um, with students in, in that department. And if you would like to read about this, Nikki wrote an article called Changing the Paradigm, a very practical MA, in the same book I mentioned earlier. Uh, where she describes the, the work that happens in there and how we have this internal practice teaching so the students have a lot of practice before they do their school placement practice teaching. So I'd like to jump now to some things about language. We, we're all pretty familiar with the idea of the four skills and the four systems, though not everybody uses the term four systems. That's what they are. And they... They have these sorts of relationships with each other. And what is most important to this talk and probably to language teaching in general is the central role of vocabulary. And very important in maintaining that. Um, and we know about forgetting and cramming. We had a talk about that yesterday, the importance of um, that. And we know about Bloom's taxonomy, these sorts of basic things that we, we all know and work with. Um, Bloom's taxonomy, when I introduce it to teachers, which is usually necessary when I work in China, um, when I tell them that if they look on the internet for Bloom's taxonomy, they find tens of thousands of pages that have been created by education departments around the world. If you look on Pinterest, you'll find many, many things. And the fact that it's constantly being developed and reassessed and here are some diagrams and representations of it. Uh, the one in the middle is by Alan McKenzie, who is presenting this afternoon. And this is the most recent updated uh, representation of Bloom's taxonomy that I'm familiar with. And you can see with the, the type of Venn diagram here how he has managed to conceive of the interrelationships between the, the levels and the stages. And we don't even like calling them levels and stages all the time. but. Um, that's why you get a round one and a hierarchical one, etc. But the interrelationships are, are really important. So it's constantly being reassessed and, and developed. Um, TED Talks. I try to watch two TED Talks a day when I'm at home. And this is one I've watched quite a few times. It's a very, very interesting one where he separates the idea of learning zone and performance zone. And the idea is that... Or he, the idea that he's promoting there, and he's not specifically talking about language teaching. In fact, the a very interesting example he gives is typing. We all do a lot of typing. We type, 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 which is what he refers to as our performance zone. But how much time do we actually spend getting better at typing? Why don't we just spend 10 minutes a day practicing so that we can do those punctuation marks and things instead of having to look at the keyboard? So we never actually put ourselves in the learning zone. And I actually had an example of that when I was a, a music student, my teacher accused me of not practicing, and I said, I practice all the time. She said, show me, and I showed her. And she said, that's, that's not practicing, you're still learning it. Oh, there's a difference between practicing and learning. Okay, thank you very much. And that was, that was quite an important thing to hear. So the idea of putting our students in the learning zone is really valuable, and it's kind of what we do um, when we're on the skills side, working with skills, we're developing the skills so that the students can perform the... Um, we're working with the system so that the students can perform the skills better. Uh, yeah, so what I'm worried about is that we spend a huge amount of time doing skills work, and there's not much work done on systems in classrooms. It's all output, output, output. And if that is all we do, and one of the speakers who was here at the previous conference seems to promote the idea of 
just provide students with input and give them pr output activities all the time, they will then learn. And I, as, as far as I can see, the only learning model that that can really work through is, is one of osmosis. You can just soak it up and get it better. And if you have a look at the second definition here of osmosis, if you say that people influence each other by osmosis or that skills are gained by osmosis, you mean that this is done gradually and without any obvious effort, which sounds great. Sounds great, doesn't it? And uh, this is uh, John Sinclair, who was actually the, the father of the CoBuild project. And one of my friends who worked on that project, um, Patrick Hanks, told me he remembers the day when John Sinclair came in and said, I now know how we're going to write definitions for our new dictionary. We're actually going to use if statements. So instead of definitions just being synonyms or chunks, short phrases, they're actually whole sentences that explain the word. And by the way, if you're looking to create a concept checking question, look no further than a sentence definition from Kerbill Dictionary, because it's a great source for those because it contains the elements of the meaning and the if statement provides the, the background situation. If you want to see a normal English definition, not a learner definition, if you click on the osmosis, so the English tab that will give you uh, a normal definition for native speakers. So the idea of osmosis should be fabulous, <coughs> but um, it doesn't seem to be the case. And as Michael Swan says, in fact, you read it while I have a drink of water. And this is um, pretty much what my, vi my violin teacher was telling me when she said, you're not practicing. Any engagement with playing the instrument should be making you better. Well, I'm afraid it wasn't. So I I'd like to take to task task-based learning and ask if that is osmosis. And these are the features which uh, Ellis, Rod Ellis, is it, um, lists. Now, I'll let you read those. I think we're familiar with them. <coughs> but as Swan, as Swan went on to say, uh, he wrote a, a very big article critiquing task-based learning in 2005, which was published in this renowned journal. Um, he wasn't very enamored of it for, th for that reason. Um, yeah, so the idea that you have your students using what they know rather than inputting very much which is new, which tends to happen a lot in task-based situations. Uh, and this idea of these two types of rehearsal, which I didn't want to show that slide, Oh, yes. Um, comes from this book, which Linda might be interested in, Becoming Fluid. This is written by two cognitive scientists from MIT. Uh, Becoming Fluent. So these things we do in maintenance rehearsal, which are not very sophisticated, and we'll have a look at some other unsophisticated things in a moment, or the more elaborative ones which um, have us internalize our learning to a much better extent. <coughs> so. Teachers know about these sorts of things. Um, methodology becomes the central tenet of task-based pedagogy. Interested in what they learn, no, sorry, no attempt is made in what they learn, but in how they learn. And in a, a book published this year, TESOL, Rethinking TESOL, um, makes a, a similar point that TESOL teachers do not see themselves as language experts, but rather as teaching experts. This implies giving priority to the how over what, as would agree with Swan's comment from almost 15 years earlier. So what, <coughs> what declarative knowledge do we have about language? Well, we know all of those things, don't we? So there's nothing new there. 
What about the other very important thing? What's our declarative knowledge of vocabulary? Well, our declarative knowledge of vocabulary consists of things like we know a few word combinations, we know a little bit about collocation, we know uh, some cultural differences, some regional variation between words and phrases, things like homophones, prefixes and suffixes. But none of those things that we know that come under those headings are particularly systematic about vocabulary. Every one is a, a tidbit, a, an isolated piece of information about a word, so not very systematic. And this is a, a, the list of conference themes, and I've chosen this EuroCal, but it could have been many, many things. EuroCal is the European Organization for Computer Assisted Language Learning. You don't need to read that, but the point is there's not one theme for that conference which actually deals with language. And it's not uncommon. I've seen it many times. And I'm, I'm the chair of a SIG, a EuroCal SIG, so I pointed this out and the following year was better. But it's, I find it quite distressing that there is so little attention given to language and we wonder why the, the Japanese nuclear scientist students can't, can't even say anything. So as I said before, these new linguistic features beget new learning tasks and what we're really aiming for, I, I, in my, my conception of it at least, is that we're aiming at to make our students more fluent, accurate, sophisticated and idiomatic. So that's my, that's my aim in life, one of them. So we, this is our linguistic hierarchy. This is for written language. The hierarchy of language for spoken is a little bit different, but for that. And if we start at the top, because we can go top down and bottom up. If we start at the top with text, we, we are working with skills. And it's a little bit modified by register and genre, but those things are what we do when we're working at the text level. And that's when our students are in their performance zone. But if we want to put them in their um, learning zone, then we need to think about vocabulary and grammar, functional language. And this idea of the, the bottom three elements of the hierarchy of language are when we're dealing with vocabulary, the middle three levels when we're dealing with grammar, the top two when we're dealing with functional language, and I've slotted pronunciation, the fourth system over here between listening and speaking. But this is, this is how these things uh, develop, relate, and I think it's really important for how we conceptualize what we do and make sure that we balance the learning zone and the performance zone aspect of our work. So, keeping him in mind, Mr. Bricenio. So, the problem is, uh, for many of us, is that there is too much to learn and that vocabulary is it's seen as a never-ending quest, um, that there are no rules, vocabulary is random, <coughs> and we just create these lists. And here are the things that we, <coughs> when we're talking about knowing a word, we deal with these sorts of things, and we might put them into things that look like that. And that's, that's about as far as it goes, and it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with uh, elementary students or very advanced students. There's, there's kind of no evolution in our thinking about vocabulary when we're, we're teaching it. And I'm sure you're familiar with these types of activities, which I th would regard as inevitable. And they're not useless and they're not bad. But I do have these problems. With, oh, gosh, what's happened? I do have these problems with them. And... Oh. <laughs> Something worked today. Um, but th these, are, these are the sorts of, th these, these, I suppose, to be honest, these are my reactions to the activities over there on the right. Treats every word as an island. The activities are not interactive. They're not much fun. They don't have any aesthetic appeal. They're not active. There's no skills training. You're not learning how to learn. You're learning discrete information, it's top-down, teacher says do this. No respect for students' intelligence, a limited sense of achievement, surface meaning only, and no depth of vocabulary knowledge required. So I don't use any of those anymore, um, but I wouldn't have got to where I am in the foreign languages I do speak without them. So I'm not condemning them or anything like that. 
I'm just saying that we, um, as our students get become more advanced and become older, we can do a bit more than that because as far as I know, those sorts of activities are still in advanced vocabulary books. Oh. Yes, and I've got, I've got unbearable lightness of being over there for another reason. Um, life is kind of trivial. It's like, well, it's all so light and jolly and happy and everything and let's not challenge our students and make them work too hard. Let's just have a nice lightness of being. I find it unbearable. Um, you might recognize these people, um, both, of whom both of whom have been mentioned this week. And they didn't get to where they are going, well, sorry, they didn't get to where they've gone, um, without a lot of work um, and a lot of study and a lot of understanding. So I'm trying to say that with uh, teaching students and more advanced students with uh, vocabulary, we can actually engage them in more sophisticated concepts. And I think university students wouldn't be very surprised if they were a bit more challenged when working with vocabulary. Um, science, uh, yeah, sports people learn about physiology and nutrition. Photography students learn about light, color, form. Computer students learn about programming language, theories of database design, cybersecurity. Music students learn about sonata form, tremolo, variations and paradiddles, etc. So I think when we're teaching uh, fairly smart students like university students or even university teachers who are having to learn English, that we can actually ask a bit much, a bit more of them. They're, they're not stupid. And I find it really bizarre that we even need to defend terminology, but people are scared of it. People don't want to seem to terrify their students with terminology because it's, I don't know, I don't even know. But, you know, we, we know different things and we can conceive of the world when we've got terminology. Um, when you live in the Czech Republic, you find out that everybody knows about 40 or 50 or 60 or here's actually a dictionary of mushrooms, Czech English dictionary of mushrooms, and, and people know about it. They don't have any problem with knowing the terminology. English native speakers usually know about six types of mushrooms as far as I know. Um, and if you don't know anything about cars, it's just a car. If you don't know anything about birds, it's, it's just a bird. So uh, we can do better, I think. Um, so students develop their skills and knowledge of their fields through terminology, whether in their first or second language. They develop their skills and knowledge of their fields through terminology. Without it, their conceptual understanding would be stunted and their ability to develop would be thwarted. And one of the teachers from a gymnasium who was here the other day, who's not here today, told me that she has a big problem with her students whose English is very, very good, but that they never improve their vocabulary no matter when they get from, because when they come into the four-year gymnasium at the age of 14 or 15, their English is okay, but it never gets better. They just keep using simple vocabulary and she doesn't know what to do about it. Well, she should be here. Um, and Halliday, um, he actually thought all learning was a linguistic process, and I'll believe almost anything Halliday says, and I will be happy to, more than happy to cherry pick. So, do we know these terms? The thing about these terms is that most of them actually express conceptual relationships between words, and this is something we don't teach very much. And this is from a very fine book. I recommend it to absolutely everyone in the world, Learning to Read, Reading to Learn. And they have a pretty good go at, at language teachers too for avoiding terminology and dealing with things in a kind of folk sense. So here is uh, an excerpt from the 
affinity map from the recapitulation of my course. And this is the yellow section has got these sorts of terms in it. And even within the course of one week work, working with academic teachers, we, we covered quite a few things there. So a reasonable question, I think, to ask is what did linguists ever do for us? Because these are the, the people who actually develop the, the, the core of our work if we regard ourselves as language teachers, not language teachers. Um, teaching the past tense can be tricky, but if we know that there is one core concept related to all of the uses of past tense, which is distance and three different types of distance, that helps us conceptualize it. Prepositions, hand up if you think prepositions are grammar. Hand up if you think they're vocabulary. Hand up if you think both. It depends, mm -hmm. okay. And there are two other things here which I'll talk about in a moment. A linear unit grammar, a very, very interesting conceptualization of language. This is a text I found in a, a Chinese year eight book a couple of years ago. Um, looks like a normal text, well it is a normal text, uh, but I was just delighted that it fits so perfectly the linear unit grammar model which says that the black stuff there is, expresses the message of a text. And the blue stuff is the organization and orientation language. If you just look at the black stuff by itself, it could almost be bullet points or a summary because we don't usually include orientation, organization language there. Very interesting conceptualization of any text spoken or written and it begets a language task. And we can do lots of things with that conceptualization of language once we have it. Um, it comes from a book of the same name by John Sinclair and Anna Marinen. And she's at uh, University of Helsinki. Um, I don't think he invented it. Um, <coughs> J.R. Firth, who is the most important British linguist of the 20th century and everybody who does this work on collocation, colligation, text linguistics in the British mo model is regarded as a Neo-Firthian and I regard myself as one. Um, he uh, taught Sinclair and he also taught Michael Halliday and Michael Halliday also describes orientation and message language but uses much more complicated terminology, so I prefer to use the un linear unit grammar terminology. But it's basically the same in a very valuable way of looking at text. And this is um, some of my students' work in China last year and this year, two different things. I don't actually teach my students about linear unit grammar. I give them bits of paper and they sit in, in groups in islands and they sort it out for themselves and they, have, they, they create these maps. The maps are not on the pieces of paper of that I give them, and once they've done that, they then present it to the rest of the group because the, the, the groups are working on different projects at the same time. So this is part of my exposition of the course, where we, where th which is front-loaded, and they deal with different aspects which we then use during the course. So when we're dealing with O language, orientation organization language, we're dealing often with functional language, conjuncts, disjuncts, conjunctions, etc. And when we're dealing with message language, we're dealing with um, the actual core meanings of things which revolve around subject, verb, object, etc. So they teach themselves that. Prepositions. <coughs> Just a quick word about prepositions. They're very tricky. They create a lot of problems for a lot of, uh, lot of students in, in pretty much any language. And the Longman Grammar of Spoken and Written English has a very tiny paragraph about them, about prepositions and it divides them into bound and free. And as soon as you have some sort of conceptualization of different functions of prepositions, you can, you know how to think about it. So bound prepositions are like that. They're, they're bound to the word before them. And free prepositions start prepositional phrases. And this is, I think, also answers the question, bound prepositions 
are grammar, and three prepositions are vocabulary. Easy, once you know. Um, gr grammar patterns, hugely important aspect, and this is what I did my dissertation on. Um, one grammar pattern here, verb, noun, at noun, and for example, point, shout, and buy, and sh point, shout, and buy are, are in square brackets because they are uh, hyphenyms for many, many words which mean point, also use that structure, verb, noun, at noun. Many words which have similar semantics to shout have that structure, etc. So this applies to nouns, verbs, and adjectives, and a very uh, structural aspect of the language, very teachable, very useful, and a very good way to raise your vocabulary because you can, you don't have to use point, you can use other words that have that same meaning but are more specific or something, and it's how that gymnasium teacher could elevate her students' vocabulary by providing with these things. The fact that they are working in structures, many of which have prepositions, is also uh, addresses that problem. And as soon as you say verb, noun, at noun, you've not only got vocabulary, but you've actually got syntax. You've got the core of a sentence. Now, I think our students are pretty bright. I, I don't have any hesitation doing this sort of thing with, with the students I've been working with. These are, some of, these are some of the things that our students do. And I think if they can do this, they can pretty well cope with bound and free prepositions, linear unit grammar, uh, grammar patterns, etc. And this is the other paradigm that I use extensively, data information knowledge. On the right-hand side, you'll see that's some of my students preparing to present that to their colleagues. Um, the, the Lego one actually makes it very clear that data is just messy collection of things that when we find patterns in it, it then becomes information, and then when the information is integrated into our way of thinking, it becomes knowledge. And that's the Vygotsky idea of knowledge creation from multiple sources, and it becomes your own. So knowledge is um, subjective. Information is what we teach. Most of our teaching involves passing information on. We don't do very much data collection in our teaching, but sometimes we do even find someone who is, an, uh, is a little bit of data collection that you then find patterns in the data and work with that. But we don't, we don't do it in any sort of linguistic sense. So I, that's a valuable paradigm. All right, so what am I leading to? What's my big idea? Well, I hope I've got time for it. Okay, <laughs> my big idea is a series of steps. It involves learning language from language. Each step develops students' linguistic knowledge, their language, and also their skills about working with language. I'm very interested in working with authentic texts, um, and deriving the key messages. Remember we said messages and orientation organizational language, so the messages from the text. And I think this is of great value to those, that doesn't say click, that says CLIL. Um, so, you're probably familiar with word clouds, and I think word clouds are a very good way to get students into a text. And here is the word cloud of a text on in fact, what do you think it's on? Climate change. Mm -hmm. and, and before the students see the text, we can, we can ask them these sorts of questions. The general topic, can you match any of the words? Which words in that word cloud belong with other words? They might, find, they might, might form compound nouns, they might be collocations, colligations. What sort of text is it? What modal verbs can you see? And as soon as you see a lot of modal verbs, you know it's a, s a certain type of text. And what do you think the purpose of this text is? So it's a, a genre question. So we can start with that. Um, now the next thing I do in this structure that I'm introducing is something I call topic trails. And Czech people will be quite quite familiar with this sign that we find in not only in, in forests, but also in towns and villages and even in Prague. Actually, I haven't seen any in Brno, but apparently they're in Prague. 
Um, and they mark different walking trails. And as you're walking through the forest, for example, you see um, the colored mark and you know to follow that one and it takes you on, on a specific route. Um, so I, I've used that metaphor of topic trails because what I've found is that looking at, looking at any text, there are usually four, three, four or five, but mostly four um, topic trails through a text. So I've highlighted them here so you can see how they interweave. And so anything there in yellow in the text is actually to do with the trails themselves. Anything there in gray is to do with walking because they're talking about the organization, which the organization of walking, of the tourist trails, um, and then history because they give some background to it. So there's four topic trails through that text. So I've just chosen that text because it's to do with the trails that weave through forest. And here I've got trails weaving through a text. Here's um, a short text from that person, if you know who that person is. And he's got a wonderful blog called The Red Hand Files. And I read this a few months ago. So I wrote to him and said, can I include your text in my book, please? And he said, yes, just send me a copy. So you find that there are four topic trails here. This is actually uh, the middle third of it. It's not a very long text, but the middle third of it. Um, this is a very short, a very short text I've, I've been using. It was um, in one of my earlier books um, about a, a little boy with malaria. And I've got three topic trails marked there. And here's the, in fact, this is the first text I ever used this with. It's where I actually came up with the idea of identifying these trails. And it's got four topic trails. So I find that pretty much any, any text I look at has got these trails. And think about what the students are doing when you're asking them to identify trails in a text. Find all the words that relate to each of these topics. What are they doing? What's happening here? So once we've got the trails, sometimes you just give one group. You, you look for the disease words. You look for the health words. You look for those words, sorts of things. Um, then we can write them on in, in lists. And once we've got them in lists, they, they start to tell their own story. And we find relationships between the words themselves, which we'll have a look at. So this comes under the heading of lexical semantics. And lexical semantics seems to be a very scary term. But it shouldn't be for somebody who uh, is going to be a doctor or a computer scientist, because it's just another term. Um, what we find in, in those topic trails is we find relationships like this. A cause and effect relationship, so you've got those words there. Affixes, conversion, which is the same word used as a noun or a verb, very common in English. Hyponyms, BSE is a type of disease, and meronym is a part of. So offal tissues, afterbirth carcass, are parts and features of sheep. So asking students to find relationships between the words which are in a text that they're working with is also, I think, uh, quite a sophisticated and valuable uh, vocabulary learning activity. Here are the topic trails from the extreme weather one when we had the, the first word cloud. So that's that series of words looking like that. And I did this in China two weeks ago. I was working with a group of teachers who are not English teachers, but they're teachers of biology, acoustics, various subjects. Um, and they have to teach in English. So that's what I was doing there, working on an EMI program. And this is their work. So they were finding the relationships between the words. And it's, I think, if you want someone to really focus on the message of a text, looking at the vocabulary in this way is very, very valuable. It also teaches a lot about writing and how messages are structured through a text. Um, then, of course, maybe I didn't point out that most of the words in topic trails are nouns. Nouns are the main message carriers, carriers of any text. And they have collocating verbs, and they have collocating adjectives. So by focusing on the nouns and then looking at what they, how they work in the text is pulling out the messages. So 
That's what we do with collocation. Now, normally, we can find collocations as lists, as we have over there. I don't know if you can see what word that's the collocation list of. Or we can get them from word sketches, which are lists, except uh, the words are structured in a word sketch according to their grammatical relationship with the search word. Or we can derive them from a text. And that's what I'm really interested in, deriving from text. All right. So, if we, if we go back to this paradigm for a moment, if we take the word information, when information is the object, somebody provides information, collects information, discloses information, very different verbs when information is the subject. Information concerns, information provides. So that's, I think that's a very important observation for students to make. Same things apply to knowledge. In fact, the same things apply to everything. And, and to data. And quite interestingly, the verbs on the left and right of any of those words are, are mostly different. And the words that are on the, on the right of any of those are mostly different because the way we conceptualize each of them is different. The way we talk about them is different. So they're going to have different collocation verbs depending on their role in the sentence. And just another quick example of that. Did anybody see what word that's the colloca collocations of? Problem. Very good. So here we have some collocates of problem, all quite standard collocates. But what is really interesting is the fact that the objects, sorry, the subjects of those verbs are quite different. And once again, they're in square brackets because of the, um, because they represent the uh, a whole set of words can come under those. So all of those are different. So we have the collocates, but we need then to consider what the ob subjects are. And then once again, you've got subject, verb, object. Now, I have just commissioned this piece of software um, to be created, and this is something that you can all use to go and insert a text. This is the extreme weather text. Put it into that text, uh, into that text box, and click on word cloud, and it will make a word cloud, and you can do many more things with this word cloud than any other word cloud software that currently exists. One is under attribute, you can choose lemma. So instead of seeing start, start, starting, started, you will only see start. So it groups them. Um, and unlike any other word cloud software, it's not only the, all, cl all cloud software will make relative sizes depending on the frequency of the word in the text. But these are color coded for part of speech. So it's got some linguistic intelligence, which most of these programs don't have. And you can choose not to show these words because they're common words in any text, so they don't often have much value. So you can leave those out. And then when you click any of those words, it will then show you how those words are used in this text. So you're just using a single text as your corpus. So you can do a lot of very, very good work on keywords in text. So these are some of the um, nouns in the text and how they are talked about in this text. And you can click a button which will color code all of the words according to part of speech, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. So that's a very nice thing. Or you can show, and I think it looks fabulous actually, you can actually show um, all of the function words. And when you, that's colligation, when you do that, you can actually see how could is used and how would is used and how the preposition by is used because it's not always a preposition that's sometimes marking the passive. So you can study the grammar of the vocabulary through, through looking at these sorts of things. Um, okay. So th they're the colligations in this text. So it's called VersaText, and I'll show you the URL in a moment. So what I have my students then do is once they've got their uh, keywords, I ask them to write on the left and the right, and they can see those words that go with it, and they start to form word templates. And here, the, here they are hard at work creating their word templates, and they're on the walls having a little art gallery moment 
looking at their, their work. And when we get a word template, we actually get a core message, we get all the core messages of the text. So climate change is a threat, climate change progresses, agreement sets targets to tackle climate change. So all of those sorts of things are the messages of the text. So if you pull out all of those, you've then in fact got a summary of the text. So that's asking students to, to do some pretty nice things with text. They're, um, the idea of these word templates is closely related to Patrick Hank's work, where he, uh, he only works with verbs. And he creates these uh, human or institution or activity overcomes eventuality. So that's very valuable. So what I find using word templates, each one is a message. It allows you to write a summary of each topic trail. You can write each of those on slips. These are activities, obviously. Uh, keep them in your vocabulary. You can convert them into questions, and it becomes a speaking activity about the text. If you, as often happens, you've got texts on related topics, then you can compare them and find out what one text is saying about something compared to another. Comparing them with L1 is very valuable. It's quite surprising to find how words are used in L1 and L2. Oh, yes, and once you've taken out all the word templates, you've got um, those things. Uh, you've got the O language. So, in a word, the students are in their learning zones. They're converting data into information and then into knowledge. They're developing linguistic concepts that support their vocabulary development. So, we're not doing basic things with advanced students. We're doing advanced things with advanced students. Hopefully, demystifying vocabulary, that it's a tool for life that it's a skill that they can use in many situations, and that they're task-based activities. And I won't tell you about that. So, this, um, that last part of the presentation is very much part of what's um, in my book, which I'm hoping to finish shortly. And as we all know, when we're leaving the cinema, the book was better. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not finished yet, so the book will be better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. <coughs> I always admire your work, and it's a pleasure to work with you all the time. Thank you so much, James. <coughs>